Next on the news. Bombs and explosions as a horrific scene plays out in Ukraine's major cities. People panic-stricken as the Russian takeover wages on. It's awful. You have to, you have to act, guys. Tens of thousands of people fleeing the country as a Catholic charity warns Ukraine is headed for a humanitarian crisis. History in the making. President Joe Biden nominating the first black woman to the highest court in the land. This as the first black cardinal in the United States celebrates Black History Month in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Plus, the incoming president of Fordham University breaking the glass ceiling. A laywoman is taking over the Jesuit University for the first time in almost 200 years. I'm Jessica Easthope in for Christine Perzichetti. This special edition of Currents News starts right now. The sound of air sirens piercing the night sky in Ukraine as Russia continues its attacks against the nation. Heavily armed Russian troops are headed toward the capital of Ukraine, causing U.S. officials to worry the city of Kiev could fall in the coming days. This as signs of a diplomatic solution could still be on the table. The president of Ukraine asking for direct talks with Vladimir Putin. Chris Wynn reports on the latest. Tension and fear mounting in Ukraine. The capital city of Kyiv lit up overnight. This bridge leading from Russian-held Crimea into the main part of Ukraine is where President Volodymyr Zelensky says the most intense fighting took place and where his army was able to push back Russian troops. Residents across the country fleeing for their lives. We don't know what's going to happen here next. I think the best thing right now is to be safe. It's, it's not be here. Just Ukrainian leaders, including former President Petro Poroshenko, encouraging those staying to take up arms to defend their country. We are standing in line for the weapons. We are standing in line to give our blood to the, our uh, soldiers. Even as air raid sirens wailed, Russia continued its propaganda campaign, claiming its troops are there on a peacekeeping mission. Nobody is going to attack the people of Ukraine. Nobody is going to somehow degrade the Ukrainian armed forces. We are talking about preventing neo-Nazis and those promoting genocide from ruling this country. Zelensky says the latest U.S. sanctions against Moscow aren't enough. This morning we are defending our country alone. Just like yesterday, the most powerful country in the world looked on from a distance. Russia was hit with sanctions yesterday, but these are not enough to get these foreign troops off our soil. Only through solidarity and determination can this be achieved. Chris Wynn, Currents News. The charitable organization Caritas is on the ground in Ukraine helping people wherever they can. But with tens of thousands fleeing the country and more estimated to be internally displaced, Caritas is warning that Ukraine is headed toward a humanitarian crisis. Claudia Torres reports on what they see as the biggest challenges ahead. It's no longer a hypothesis. Russia struck first. And Ukraine's population fears the worst. The Secretary General of Caritas Internationalis, Aloysius John, warns that tensions in the local population are sky high. The situation of the people today, according to Caritas Ukraine, is people are, are traumatized by, uh, by the fear of the war, which may happen at any time. And, uh, and for them, uh, the children, they don't know what to do with their children, how to take care of them, and where to go are all the questions that are in their minds. In the conflict zone, there are about 2.9 million people who are living on both sides of the contact line and are in need of humanitarian assistance. He also notes that since the conflict began in 2014, more than 14,000 people have lost their lives and some 1.5 million been forced to leave their homes. First, the COVID-19 pandemic and now armed attacks are fueling anguish among Ukrainians. Another problem today uh, where Caritas uh, Ukraine is concerned is the security situation in some areas, uh, which is also preventing them from, from bringing the needed life-saving help. And this, uh, this is due to the resumption of constant shelling in some areas and the trips to the buffer zones have also been suspended today and that is a major concern for Caritas Ukraine and for Caritas International Days. Caritas Ukraine warned in a press release that the country is looking at a humanitarian catastrophe. The organization is asking the international community to guarantee the entire population access to aid. 
That was Claudia Torres reporting. If you would like to help Caritas in their efforts, you can send donations to their website, caritas.org. You can find their appeal for Ukraine right on their homepage. The Holy Father personally went to the Russian embassy in Rome Friday to express his concern about the war in Ukraine. It was a break from the usual papal procedure where Pope Francis would receive ambassadors and heads of state inside the Vatican. Holy See officials say they don't know of any previous popes who have taken the initiative to go outside the walled city state. According to reports, the Holy Father was at the embassy for half an hour. The invasion of Ukraine means that gas prices are set to soar. Oil futures are now more than $100 per barrel, its highest point since 2014. That means in a matter of weeks, gas will likely cost around $4 a gallon nationwide. As of right now, Oregon, California and Hawaii have already hit that mark. Washington and Nevada are just pennies away from reaching it. Gas prices in New York currently stand around 369. And stay with Currents News for continuing coverage of the invasion of Ukraine, you can also go to our website, currentsny.tv and thetablet.org for more updates and stories. Keeping his campaign promise to nominate the first black woman Supreme Court justice, President Biden has officially named Katanji Brown Jackson as his SCOTUS pick. The 51-year-old judge currently serves on D.C.'s Court of Appeals and has been considered the frontrunner for the vacancy since Justice Stephen Breyer announced his retirement at the end of January. For too long, our government, our courts, haven't looked like America. And I believe it's time that we have a court that reflects the full talents and greatness of our nation with a nominee of extraordinary qualifications. Democrats currently do not need Republican help to confirm a Supreme Court justice. They can do it with their 50 votes and have Vice President Kamala Harris break a deadlock. In New York on Wednesday, firefighters said a final farewell to a fallen brother. In his time with the department, Jesse Gerhardt held the title of EMT and firefighter with the most strenuous job you can have, an irons man. And now one more. For the rest of eternity, his rank will forever be hero. You do a look into the life of a hero. Jesse Gerhardt's legacy as a son, uncle, friend, and firefighter lives on in the memories of those closest to him. Jesse Gerhardt is the type of person a firefighter would describe if he was to ask to build the perfect firefighter. He did his job. He did it well. He never complained. And he made everyone around him feel safer in the face of peril. That perfect firefighter made the ultimate sacrifice. Last week, Gerhard collapsed at his Far Rockaway firehouse and was rushed to St. John's Episcopal Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. A day before, Gerhard was doing what he loved, working as an FDNY irons man, the most strenuous job in the department, breaking down the door of this burning home to help rescue victims from a raging fire. Protecting the lives and property of everyday New Yorkers was his chosen profession, his dream job, a job, not work. Jesse was also a volunteer firefighter in his hometown of Islip, where he and his family go to church. They're now leaning on their faith and parish community after his sudden passing. This is not the end, that someday we will see him again. Maybe not tomorrow or next month or next year, but we will see him again. Please know how much we love you and how we share with you in this moment. Jesse's selflessness in life and on the job is continuing in death. He's a tissue donor. And according to Live On New York, 50 to 75 people's lives will be changed thanks to his donation. His family, though they have much to be proud of, say all they want is more time. I want one more day just to show you how much we loved you. Despite reports saying Gerhardt suffered from a heart attack, his exact cause of death remains unconfirmed. Heart attacks are the number one cause of death in firefighters nationwide. There's a lot more news headed your way. A pastor from the Bronx is set to become the nation's youngest bishop. When and where you can find his ordination. One of the most unique houses of worship is now open in Italy. A look inside the extraordinary church that was 10 years in the making. With Black History Month coming to a close, Cardinal Wilton Gray Gregory is urging black Catholics in the Diocese of Brooklyn to take pride in their gifts and talents. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org.
Not a bad song, right? Well, what if I told you the rapper you're listening to will soon be the youngest bishop in the U.S.? Father Joseph Espeot, or Father J, has just been named an auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of New York, and he may look familiar to you. He's been on NetTV before, helping us with papal coverage. Christine Persichetti caught up with him and asked what it was like when he got that special call from the Vatican. I received six phone calls from Washington, D.C. Uh, on uh, my day of rest on Monday. So it was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I didn't pick up the call because I thought it was spam. So... Uh, when I actually picked up the phone call, it was uh, very shocking. Yeah, I would guess, I guess so, especially that you are going to be the youngest bishop in the United States. But I have to say, I love your music, and I've been checking out your podcast, Sainthood in the City. I want to show our viewers a clip. Okay, I entered the seminary when I was 13. And uh, being Latino, uh, being, uh, you know, growing up in the city, uh, I was your average city kid. However, you went on to say that you didn't fit the mold of what people thought a priest should be or look like, and it cracked me up when you talked about listening to Snoop Dogg in the seminary. But you really know how to connect with young people. I, I know you previously served as director of youth ministry, so you could be a key to increasing vocations. Is that a role you've taken on? Oh, absolutely. Uh, vocations is very important um, in all aspects of church life. And uh, it's something that I plan to continue to, to work towards for the kingdom of heaven. It's something that I've always uh, had a love for, uh, you know, getting young people uh, to consider the call that God might be calling them to become a priest, to become a deacon, to become a religious sister, religious brother, and also holy vocations to the married life and the lay state as well. Yeah, and you received that call early. You were just saying in your podcast, you, you were 13. So you knew young that you wanted to be a priest. I didn't know exactly at 13 that I wanted to become a priest. I considered the call. Uh, it wasn't until like after college, really, that I knew for a fact after the spirituality year that the Lord was definitely calling me to become a priest. I was open the whole way. So when I was 13 years old, I saw this image of Our Lady, the Vobis in Matrem, and it was a, a draw. I felt some peace and comfort when I saw this image of Our Lady. And I applied to high school there. I didn't even know that it was really a seminary. I didn't understand what that was at age 13. But I was open to that. And, and praise God, uh, he took the steering wheel. So talk about how important technology is, like your podcast, for evangelization. Uh, it's very important. You would understand that at, at current news. Uh, it's, it's critical for us to reach the masses right now. It's critical for us to reach the young people, uh, uh, to evangelize in new ways. The new evangelization must involve technology, uh, must involve uh, social media in some way, shape or form. And it is a way for us to do it. And during the pandemic, if we're really honest, a lot of priests uh, went online. Priests who would say, oh, I'll never do that. Uh, and guess what? You, you had to transmit the Mass online to reach God's people who could not be in churches. So it is a means. It is a way that uh, we have to tap into as church and, and see and you utilize in the right way. All right, so one quick thing before we go. Everyone here at Current News is talking about how you're a bit of a sneakerhead. Yeah, you know, we noticed the kicks you were wearing on the podcast. And as a mom of oh, boys, yeah. as a mom boys, it's all about sneakers. So when did you get into it? I, I always, uh, being growing up in the city, I always had a, a, um, an inkling towards getting the latest kicks and the latest sneakers. Uh, it was about seventh grade when, when I got my first pair of Nikes, uh, like, like flashy. I remember that I, I, I got them towards the end of the school year and for the whole summer, I put them in the box. And then uh, when school began, I, I brought them back out because I didn't want to crease them and I didn't want to dirty them. So uh, probably like seventh and eighth, seventh, eighth grade about that time. But I couldn't afford them at the time either. Uh, so it wasn't until later that I was able to afford a pair of Jordans. That was Father Joseph Espeot, an auxiliary bishop elect for the Archdiocese of New York. Father Espeot will be ordained a bishop alongside Father John Benici on March 1st at St. Patrick's Cathedral at 2 o'clock. Be sure to tune in to Currents News and check the tablet for full coverage.
Italy is known around the world for its breathtaking churches, and now it can celebrate one of the most unique places of worship. The inauguration of the Church of St. James the Apostle in the town of Ferrara was 10 years in the making. That's how long it took architects to design and construct the extraordinary church. The interior is marked by its simplicity, with wood and concrete blended together to create an imposing environment filled with natural light. At the same time, with very primitive materials, because this idea of giving oneself to the earth and having something very essential is very important. The team of architects decided to highlight that principle in the altar. The rough stone symbolizes the rock upon which Jesus founded the church. Pope Francis's knee pain is acting up again, forcing the Holy Father to cancel his Sunday trip to Florence. The cancellations mean he will not be able to close a summit between Mediterranean bishops and mayors as originally planned, nor will he be able to preside over the Ash Wednesday Mass on March 2nd. Despite the flare-up, the Vatican made clear that the Pope plans to go ahead with his trip to Malta in April. Still to come on Currents News, delivering a message of hope and empowerment, the nation's first black cardinal celebrates a special Black History Month mass in the Diocese of Brooklyn. And it's history in the making. Fordham University names their first ever woman and layperson president. Black Catholics felt seen and heard in the Diocese of Brooklyn last weekend with a proud display of history and culture. And there to witness it, Cardinal Wilton Gregory, the nation's first black cardinal. He celebrated a special mass last Sunday in the home of the largest population of black Catholics in the country, the Diocese of Brooklyn. During his homily, he delivered a message of hope and empowerment, reminding black Catholics they are a gift. Spirits were lifted at Immaculate Conception Monastery Church in Jamaica Estates on Sunday. The church was packed as Bishop Robert Brennan and the Diocese of Brooklyn welcomed Cardinal Wilton Gregory, the main celebrant of the Mass of Thanksgiving for Black History Month. When the church needed a voice of authenticity, of honor, and of self-reflection, you were there to lead all of us and so we will be always, always grateful. Thank you. God bless you. Cardinal Gregory's message to the black Catholics in attendance, be proud. We are a gift to this country. The Thea Bowman Mass Choir, with many members dressed in traditional African garb, served as the score for the Mass. Cardinal Gregory used his homily to not only empower black Catholics, but promote unity within the church. It is also a time for nation building and for strengthening the bonds that tie us together as one people. Cardinal Gregory, who's achieved several milestones as the first, including the first black president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, has always been outspoken about the evils of racism. And Sunday was no different. People of color have not always received the acceptance and honor that our human dignity and cultural contributions to this nation of ours has deserved. According to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Diocese of Brooklyn is home to nearly 215,000 black Catholics. This is your last chance to attend a Black History Month Mass in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Last year, the parish of St. Michael, St. Malachi in East New York held its own celebration, and this year it's coming back. It's this Sunday and includes a Mass, student presentations on Black Catholic Saints, guest speakers, and so much more. Mass begins at 9 a.m. The church is located at 225 Jerome Street in Brooklyn. Then, celebrations and presentations will continue at Salve Regina Catholic Academy, located at 237. Jerome Street. Now to another historic first. At the hallowed Fordham University, a woman is set to take the helm, marking the first time ever the Jesuit University hasn't had a man or a priest as president. But Tanya Tetlow is used to breaking the glass ceiling. She was also the first laywoman to lead Loyola University in New Orleans. I asked her how it felt to be making history twice. 
I have learned a lot from making this transition here at Loyola New Orleans about um, using it as a chance for lay people to really remember that we have to own the mission too, that it is the responsibility of each and every person at the university to speak in the language of our Jesuit Catholic values, to understand the charism, to make the mission manifest. So I hope I practiced that well here and um, loved every minute of it, and I'm very excited to bring that to Fordham truly leading from the middle, right? And you and your family have a really, really unique connection to Fordham. Tell me a little bit about it. Uh, it is pretty unique. Um, my parents met at Fordham. My mom was a graduate student uh, studying to be a theologian, and my father was actually a Jesuit priest studying at Fordham for his PhD. And so they met and um, fell in love, and my dad had the very hard decision to make of how best to um, serve God's calling, and uh, he, he decided that he really felt called to be a husband and a father. And so um, he left and they got married and I was born in New York, as was my sister, and um, spent first three years running around that campus. And again, like you said, your father was a priest, your uncle is a priest, and your mother a theologian. How has the depth of faith in your family really contributed to the person you've become? Well, I got sung to sleep with Gregorian chant and dinner table conversations really revolved around theology and biblical history. So I uh, had no choice about getting a Jesuit education from birth. It's really so deeply rooted in me and it's been such a joy to find all of the ways that that training is part of who I am. And Thus, how I can connect it, not just with the, the taglines and the ways we talk about things, but at a, at a really deep level of connecting it to absolutely everything that we do. And I understand that you have had a pretty famous mentor, Congresswoman and Ambassador to the Vatican, Lindy Boggs. Did you learn any important lessons from her? So many lessons. She was someone who lived out her faith and integrity and virtue um, while not hiding away from the world that she found the strength to exercise great power as a member of Congress and as an ambassador um, while being an incredibly devout Catholic and remarkable human being. And Tanya, as you prepare to make the big move this summer and assume the leadership at Fordham, what goals do you have for this venerable institution? It is already so academically excellent and so relevant to the world is to make it more so, is to continue that constant striving for the magis, as we say, to do ever more and to um, be part of making it the kind of elite institution that still provides an engine of opportunity for so many families who are the first to go to college. Um, that creates the research that solves the problems of the world, and most of all, that really um, succeeds because of mission, not in spite of it, that we double down on who we are and why we matter. That was Tanya Tetlow, the incoming president of Fordham University. Tanya will be installed as president on July 1st. We wish her the best of luck in her new role. And finally tonight, even in the middle of war, love finds a way. A young couple in Ukraine opting to ditch their May wedding and instead get married Thursday. Yurinya Arieva and Sviatoslav Fursin shared wedding vows inside St. Michael's Monastery as their hometown of Kiev was under attack. After exchanging I do's, the newlyweds headed to the local territorial defense center to join efforts to help defend the country. Yurinya says even though they know they could both die, they just wanted to be together. And that is Currents News. I'm Jessica East Hope. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.